Arguably, Van de Graaff were a truly progressive band in that they progressed every element of the band. We all came up with our own parts, whatever we were doing, and put, which made this very unusual sound. I don't know where they came from. We never know who wrote what, you know. If you put it all down on paper, you say, well, that's not going to work. But you listen to a Van de Graaff generator record and it's all there and it works perfectly. They weren't easy to listen to. You had to work at it, but it was worth working at because the rewards were so huge. Is Van de Graaff generator rock music? Well, I think it is. I think it rocks like a mother. It either sucked you in or it spat you out. Just one breath and sins and death is the aerosol grey machine. Just one breath and sins and death is the aerosol grey machine. When to understand what aerosol grey machine was, you really have to go back to the birth of Van de Graaff Generator. It started in Manchester with Chris Dudge Smith and of course Peter Hamill. When I got to Manchester University, I answered an ad which said anyone interested in rock music come to room C16. So about 20 guys with clutching guitars turned up. There was one guy sitting on the floor playing a song, singing a song to himself and I stopped and I listened and he had an amazing voice and the song was fantastic. And I thought, aha, this is the man. And this is Peter Hamill. So that was how the band started. My form is mystic, but my heart Once we got a full band together, there wasn't really a tremendous amount left for me to do, apart from stand there and wave a tambourine and do backing vocals. So I decided it would be better for the band if I bowed out. I mean, it was obvious the band were going to go places. They were managed by Tony Stratton Smith, who just formed Charisma Records. And he felt that they had a bad deal and didn't really want them to record with Mercury. But actually, the band weren't doing very well anyway. And things came to a head when they had their equipment stolen outside a, sh outside a gig. And at this point, the band got quite depressed and broke up. So. Peter decided that it was then safe for him to record um, with Mercury Records as a solo artist. Peter Hammer went in and did Aerosol Grey Machine, and then he decides, well, I need musicians. Who do I know? I don't really know anybody in London. I know. I'll call up my old mates from Van de Graaff Generator. And things went pretty well. They, in fact, recorded the whole album in two days. And, in fact, they went so well that the band thought that they would get back together again which they duly did. So he got back the band, did an album under the name Peter Hamill, which was effectively the first Van de Graaff Generator album. But of course their manager didn't want them to record for Mercury Records, so he wouldn't let the rest of the band sign. Only Peter Hamill was signed to them. But because it was him guiding it and pushing it, it's very much a solo album under that guise. And if you listen to that album, you've got tracks like Necromancer, which is definitely very Van de Graaff generator, whereas you've got a track like Octopus, which is very much pushing in the Peter Hamill solo vein. So it's a mixture of both. Now I cannot see to Musicianship is very high, of high standard, and experimentation. And I think, although it was recorded quickly, they knew what they wanted to do. It's typically quirky, um, and I think if you heard it in isolation uh, from the Van de Graaff Generator catalogue, you'd, you'd probably pinpoint it as being slightly more of a Hamill solo album because uh, it is slightly more subdued, it's slightly more esoteric perhaps than, than um, the, the later outputs. But I think instrumentally it is, it is a very formative album. To me it's interesting, some good songs in it, but it's got a very 60s type of feel compared to the later stuff. It's a curio, like many of those first albums by what would be 
seen as the great progressive rock bands. Uh, for enjoyment, I will always go to stuff later in the band's career. Looking back, it's full of holes and it doesn't stand up particularly well, but in terms of what it meant to the future, it's majorly important. For me, very much um, the whole thing sort of kicks off with the least we can do is wave to each other. The least we can do is wave at each other, which is one of those great Van de Graaff Generator album titles, was the first proper Van de Graaff Generator album. This was the album they made without the Peter Hamill solo sword of Damocles dangling over them. They went in as a band. This was a democratic unit and said, right, OK, now what are we going to do? We're going to do it together and we're going to do it locked in as a band. And because of that, it has more cohesion. And because of that, I think it's the first proper Van de Graaff Generator album. Tracks like Darkness had that ability to open up a new horizon for them. I worked out some very kind of brooding, insistent bass lines that sort of underpin it structurally. And I think Dave Jackson played some really great sax in it, you know. And Again, there was like a real momentum. It, it sort of formed itself, but we all put in our own parts and it worked very well. Darkness, you know, was a classic track for us. A great opening track, you know, we'd go on stage and start. And, you know, with all the gentle uh, rhythmic symbols and wind and ah, moaning and things. And then um, suddenly you hit the verse and you've got, you know, power, double horns and double saxes. <laughs> Darkness, I mean, is is a re it's, you plunge headfirst into into the world of music that, that this very odd and eccentric but quite enthralling band um, created. I mean, they literally they plunge you headfirst. There's no mucking around. There's no sort of dilly dallying. It's like woof in you go. You've got Peter Hamill's um, screaming vocals. You've got David Jackson's howling saxophone. Um, it's sonorous organ from Hugh Banton, all of it driven along by this bass riff. Um, it's really quite ferocious and feels like almost having your brain sucked out of your skull. It's got all the elements uh, that we now think of as being classic uh, Van de Graaff. It's got uh, an amazing tune that doesn't do what you think it's going to do. Uh, it's got deep, complex lyrics. It's got Jackson and Banton, this extraordinary duo of, of the organ and saxophones being electronically mangled. We were very physical on stage, you know, Hugh played stage right, I played stage left. That was always, the, just seemed, always seemed the balance. He had his big organ stacks and power, and I had my saxophone stacks and power. And to get the balance, you know, the double horns against the organ was very, was, you know, was what, what, what became our sound. For a Peter Hamill song, this is relatively conventional at least as regards the chord sequence. This makes it quite an accessible track for people starting off listening to the music. This is basically a three chord song, uh, but what's interesting about it is he uses an E root and then he plays a C major chord over an E root and a D major chord over an E root. And it creates a tension which works really quite well with the lyrical content of Van de Graaff Generator stroke Peter Hamill. 
So the C and the D are creating the tension against the E root. And this is very typical of the, the type of things that Peter Hamill would write and, as I say, put it to the rest of the band who would improvise or work out their parts once he presented the song to them. Quite often you'd come up with really quite a... Um, well, to varying degrees sometimes, quite worked out. And other times, like, quite a loose sort of skeleton of a structural thing to which, you know, we had virtually co-create the music. You know. Day dawns dark It now numbers it Day dawns dark It now numbers infinity Life crawls from the past Watching in wonder I trace its patterns in me The lyrics are always completely baffling with the Graph Generator um, Numerous interpretations can be made. Uh, Hamill, immensely ta talented lyricist, um, superb poet, but very obscure. I've got to tell you that I think he's a genius, and that's not a word I fling around in a casual way. He has this extraordinary gift of, of, of focus and creativity, and all this creativity and this intelligence has been poured into the art of songwriting. Peter Hamill also redefined what a, a rock and roll vocalist was supposed to be about um, in that he didn't follow any of the conventional patterns of singing. He would use his voice um, and fly into the upper registers, make almost sort of animal howling noises before returning to grunts, growls. Um, these were not in the usual rock and roll repertoire, at least not, not in the way that Peter performed them. I think he was better with Van de Graaff Generator than he was with, um, with any of his solo material. I, I think the band gave him the expanse to really move and flow and, and experiment. Hamill's always been at his best, I think, when exploring the darker side of life fears, the nightmares and so forth, and doing it in a fractured and fragmented way, and allowing the band almost to follow him. He sets the lead with the words, and they almost try to juxtapose what they do inside that particular fr framework. And it worked beautifully with darkness, because it's eerie. There's not much hope in, in, in some of, of Van de Graaff Generator's music. In fact, Bruce Dickinson um, from Iron Maiden, who's a big fan, once described their music as positively wrist slashing stuff. Now, I wouldn't go that far. This song has a particularly wonderful bass riff. It's an absolute monster and it is typical Nick Potter. holds the whole thing together and it's him announcing his arrival on the scene. Nick Potter's bass part on Darkness um, starts beneath the piano and once the piano moves off into another area it kind of builds by itself in a kind of bolero-like fashion. It's a basic riff but as the song progresses he adds his own colour to this basic riff until it becomes literally a tour de force that drives the entire song. I'm not an average kind of bass player. I got into using quite a lot of effects, in fact, and I do a lot of things that I've never heard any other bass player do. I'm quite a powerful player, um, but I come up with a lot of, of lines. But I mean, I, I'm also a writer in my, um, you know, as well. I've made solo albums and what have you, so I kind of know about structures and what have you. Um, so I wouldn't call myself a, a straight bass player. And Nick Potter was a very good bass player, I think, because he had uh, a bit of taste. He had feel, you know, the groove, these are the important things for him as a bass player. Some of the, the tracks required a bit of technical ability, which he obviously had. So he came, I think, from the right school of music. Uh, it wasn't just technical. That is quite prevalent on not just Darkness, but quite a lot of the tracks that he was involved in. I don't, I don't think you could turn around and say he was a genius in, in musical terms. I think it'd be fairly hard to say that about almost any bass player. 
but he was a he was a highly competent bass player. He's just perfect for the job. He fits in beautifully. He sounds completely assured, completely at home with this this weird music. Even the sound he uses is is just perfect. And he anchored a lot of the music, so that when they went off on their flights of fancy, there was always the man there rooting it. Really, I think the best thing that you can say um, about him, you know, as a bass player, is that he didn't stick out. And in in those terms, that that's actually that's actually praise and not not uh, criticism. <laughs> The combination of Potter and Guy Evans in uh, Van de Graaff Generator was one of pretty much locking together and making sure there was a solidity. There was nothing particularly outlandish about what they did, although both could actually go off and explore if they needed to. They weren't bad musicians at all, but what they did was combine the way that a, a drummer and a bassist really should do. Well, Guy Evans, first of all, is an excellent drummer, and uh, you know he's got lots of musicality within his drumming. Not just a technical drummer, uh, he could do the sort of the funky chicken drumming as well as the sort of fast technical stuff. And when he had Nick in the band, they locked together really well. And as I said, they created the engine room of the band. And I, I and for me, any band has to have a solid rhythm section. They're very different. Um, Guy Evans is is sort of um, almost like a psychedelic jazz drummer, really. His interjections and fills are not like regular rock drummer's stuff. It doesn't come at the end of every eight bars. The drummer goes... Dub -dub 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 -dub. You don't get that with Guy. You get an extraordinary short passage of solo percussion work. Something pops out and moves the song on in a different direction. There's no other drummer like him. It's not like a standard, straight four type drummer at all. They can do that stuff if required. Very intuitive and very powerful but on a big stage he can really hack it and comes alive. Whatever would Robert have said is actually about Robert van de Graaff, the scientist who inspired the van de Graaff generator and indeed gave them their name. The song is characterized by Hugh Banton's magisterial organ work, which really comes from his church background. The, the classical church sound that Hugh Banton um, portrayed became very quickly one of his trademarks, but it became a trademark of the band as well. Well, Hugh is basically Mr. Organ, if I could put it that way. I mean, he was primarily an organist. Um, he's an expert on church organs. Even with Van der Graaff, when he was in Van der Graaff before, he built his own organ. Look, I mean, he's like Rob Boffin. You know, he's Mr. Organ. Well, I think this is really the wrong, the wrong word to use. He's a classically trained musician. He's Royal College of Organists, as far as I can remember. Great player, very unique, very original, unlike any other. But essentially, he's a, a, a really good organ player in the sense that he would play bass pedals when Nick Potter wasn't in the band. They didn't have a bass player, so he'd be playing bass pedals. And uh, he also uh, was able to see the bigger picture musically. Um, he would create sort of slightly odd sounds so he understood the instrument very well. Hugh often would realise that we needed this to finish the piece, to resolve all of the things that were going on and he'd say I need, I need, give me, give me, a, give me an evening, give me an afternoon and we'd all go off and throw a cricket ball at a wall or something. I felt like, you know, I had arrived in Van der All the things I'd been doing for all these years, I mean, I started when I was about 13. So Van der comes along, I've been you know, doing it for eight, nine years. I think I know how to play, I want to play. 
David Jackson was and is again a great freeform musician, one who goes off on his own and seems to lose his way so often, but you never get tired of following the journey. You may end up in a cul-de-sac, but what a great cul-de-sac it was, and sometimes with David Jackson you feel the journey is far more intriguing than the actual destination. Often when we were playing between the organ, Peter on guitar or Peter on keyboard or Peter on voice, you're not absolutely sure who played that. Oh God, it was me. You know, not absolutely sure who played what at certain moments um, of, of confusion. Something very special about his playing, he can be extremely emotive, uh, almost in a way that when you hear his, his playing, it stirs something, you know, you kind of feel like a tear's about to come. It's a weird thing, you know, he can be like that. Or very kind of powerful. He plays saxophone like it was an electric guitar. You listen to it and, and, and he caters for, he fills the space where you might expect the guitar to be with the most a wonderful array of sounds from, from his, his various saxophones. He is a, an amazing mu musician. He, he's capable of, of uh, tremendous lyricism and great blasts of raw power. <laughs> I'm not a saxophone player who sits around smoking a cigarette, you know, waiting for the, for the solo to come in about ten minutes' time. I should play a solo or something. I'm not like that. I've just got to be part of the music all the time. I mean, the trick he had was doing the double saxophone, playing two at once, which is almost like the double neck guitar. Again, it was, it was a trick. It was a fairground trick, if you want, something like that. But it worked well because not only was he actually impressing visually and people going, wow, look at what he's doing, it actually did have a great sound. What I really remember from those early sessions was, you know, he'd be standing there um, without being amplified at all, and the sheer volume coming from his saxophones, you know, it was like he had two martial amps, you know, stacks going up, you know, Mark 11 volume, you know, unbelievable, it's like you almost had to, you know, can you, can you turn, you know, turn it down a bit, and it just acoustically. You have to bear in mind that I was playing if, with effects. I was playing with octave dividers, so it wasn't just two saxophones. Sometimes it was, I mean, in the most ridiculous sounds, it was eight, because I've got one up, uh, one, two up, one up, and one below, two below, and that's the one I'm playing. So, I mean, effectively, it's a ridiculous five note chord with all the split harmonics in it. It is grunge, basically, before grunge existed. It's, this is the kind of wallop that, that I was able to do. The least we can do is wave to each other is far, far better than uh, the aerosol grey machine. I mean, on a personal level, it's my favourite Van de Graaff Generator album. I, I mean, I think it's fantastic. The least we can do is wave at each other. It was a better album than Aerosol Grey for three major reasons. One, the lineup was now solid. It was recorded at the great Trident Studios in Soho, which Bowie and lots and lots of different people used to use. The Beatles used it, in fact, as well. And they had a producer, John Anthony. And I think the whole thing was more cohesive. So they got together not to add on to Peter's tracks, but as a band. It's very much more sophisticated. The recording technique is very much more polished. The songs are more geared to the band. You have Jackson now, the final element, stirred into the mix, the final bit of alchemy. And you have Nick Potter. Yeah, it was the first proper <coughs> Van Gogh generator album, as far as I'm concerned. And the record company were very much behind us, which, which was great. There was like, a huge feeling of momentum within the band, you know, we're kind of unstoppable.
H to He Who Am The Only One is one of these convoluted Van de Graaff titles. I'm sure they came up with that song album title one night when they were drunk. H to He Who Am The Only One, yes. Not only, not only did Van de Graaff make, make sometimes difficult music, they also had difficult album titles as well. H to He actually stands for Hydrogen to Helium. And that kind of sets up the album. It's a difficult album, really. But you are very lonely because all the other fish they are you. It has the lot, and I don't just like it because it's got one of my tunes there in Killer. It has some splendid songs. They really are terrific. And it's got Van de Graaff Generator doing what Van de Graaff Generator did. Um, going at a good tune and dismembering it, turning it inside out, playing it backwards. It's almost like an instrumental free-for-all. Everybody's playing off each other. Nobody really seems to know what the other one's going to be doing. And I think that that's part of the attraction. You know, I think... You know, they surprise the listener by going off on these tangents. And, and secretly, I think, you're surprised as well because you think they don't know what they're doing either. Age to age, you've got m more complex uh, melodies. You've got um, uh, more diverse lyrics, more different zones, you know, space. I was writing lots of nasty harmonies, vicious, aggressive harmonies in writing things like that. I mean, so frightening that uh, one of my girlfriends at the time used to cover her child's ears. Van de Graaff are steering away from the, the more traditional progressive sound that bands like Yes and Genesis were playing. They were carving out their own little niche, which was much more esoteric. It's certainly an acquired taste. H to H, he is my favorite all-time Van de Graaff generator album. And I think the track Lost um, on the album is perhaps my favorite all-time song or track that we did, you know. Um, so I think H2H is, is a great album. It just has all the elements beautifully controlled. I think it's a wonderful album. Theme one is a real oddity. The tune started life as the theme music for Radio 1 when it first started and the band had been doing it as their as an encore tongue-in-cheek encore but it came out as a single and was a huge hit I play the tune and uh, Hugh plays all the harmony and incredible improvisation from multi multiple parts that he has to play Guy plays a steaming drum track all the way through it and, um, and uh, the record company were right it was a hit and it was a hit in Italy, so, you know, it could, you know, it did, it opened the door for Van de Graaff to a much wider audience. So it's just David Jackson, Guy Evans and Hugh Banton. And Banton is playing bass pedals. Um, anyway to sort of, to mask the well to, to cater for the fact they don't have a bass player. I personally on that on theme one don't really miss the bass that much. It's a very strong melody. 
and David Jackson and Hugh Banton, who are playing the melody, play it very well. And Guy Evans, is a, as I said, is a great drummer. And uh, he's sort of free to be a bit more, I suppose, jazz-like in his approach to the playing on, on that particular track. And it worked. If theme one had been recorded by Van de Graaff Generator about five years earlier, it probably would have fitted into the style of that particular era in terms of slightly psychedelic, slightly keyboard-led and slightly upbeat tempo. But because it came out in the mid-70s, at a time when the charts were dominated by the likes of Slade, T-Rex, Mud, etc., it didn't fit at all. It was completely different to everything that, that other people were doing in terms of chart success. But then that's Van de Graaff Generator. It completely passed me by Theme 1, I think. Um, maybe it was because it was so atypically Van de Graaff um, that uh, I didn't really, didn't really notice it. <laughs> at the time. It's probably just as well it wasn't a hit because I think if Van de Graaff Generator had had a novelty hit early on in their career um, that would have screwed them right up. A Plague of Lighthouse Keepers is the masterwork as far as I'm concerned for Van de Graaff Generator. Plague of Lighthouse Keepers is widely regarded as the, the jewel in Van de Graaff Generator's crown. It's certainly their most intense and confusing hour. It's over 20 minutes in length and it's a magnificent story. For me personally, it probably is their greatest achievement. I think it was something that was waiting to happen. I am a lonely man, my solitude is true, my eyes are gone, stop with us, and now my nights are numbered. As far as I remember, um, it was a complete surprise when we got to the TV studio to find out that we were playing A Plague of Lighthouse Keepers. It was not what we thought we were there for to do. We thought we were just going to play our set. And so we had a crisis meeting and we decided we could do it in two halves. So they did a half, one half with sparklers and one half with candles. <laughs> and that's what we did. In hindsight, of course, you know, watching that performance, it, it is, it's, it's exceptional. It is exceptional, it's a fantastic feeling, because we never, we would never try our hardest to get across the point, you know, to get across the emotion, because the, the tunes are very, um, they're very emotional, they're very, very beautiful. The opening theme is absolutely divine. It's one of my favorite tunes, Peter's tunes. Um, and the end, of course, is a very, very uplifting anthem. <laughs> of Lighthouse Keepers is a 23-minute opus that was divided up into 10 different sections, um, which had such sort of curious titles as Custard's Last Stand or The Clot Thickens, which I suppose is what Van, for Van de Graaff passes as humour. But of course, length isn't always everything. And, you know, you can lose your way very easily. You get bits where the band do the jazz thing, uh, you, know, um, you know, we hope you like our New Direction Jazz Odyssey kind of off in all directions. But see, the great thing about it is it always keeps on drawing back to a central theme um, and, and climaxes quite superbly. I think the final piece, the final piece, which is called We Go Now, that melody, was perhaps the starting piece. And I actually wrote that piece, it's my, my music. And I think Peter was very taken with that melody. I think he was very taken with him, although I didn't get to play on it. This is somewhat ironic, you know. He wouldn't let me play up. No. <laughs> Can't I play a little? No. <laughs> Don't need you on that bit. <laughs> okay. All right. 
This is a self-contained story. This is a story of a lighthouse keeper and how he deals with death, with life, with not being able to save ships that crash on the rocks. We're not bothering to save some ships that crash on the rocks. It's got guilt, it's got frustration, it's got agony, it's got angst. It's a wonderful piece of work. There's some mad ideas, mad ideas. There's some beautiful melodies. There's some very, very powerful things. All the complicated bits, the sudden changes, are there for a reason. They're there for a musical reason, and they carry the story on. They carry the meaning of the lyrics on further. And the, the, the playing on it is just amazing throughout. Now, that doesn't seem very much. It's like an absolutely mad march. But you put everybody starts playing that with all the harmony and all the rhythm and all the ingredients and uh, the insane rhythm, and it, it just becomes a march of the mad zombies. It's absolutely exhilarating to play. <laughs> His musical hallmarks, I suppose, are the fact that you get songs, you get instrumentals, sections that are in different time signatures, and it goes back to sort of more standard 4-4 four, four basic songs. Then you get sound effects, you know, experimentation, bit of sort of jazz type of improvisation, squeaks, thumps and bangs as well, and then back to another song, and then, you know, maybe the, the finale you know, being a bit mixture of a bit of vocals and a bit of instrumental. So it was a, 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 a mix and match of, of all their musical styles into one long piece. It's just an incredibly impressive piece of music because it features quite disparate musical styles within the whole piece, and yet it all works as, as, as one piece of music. And that's, the, 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 you know, was obviously the great trick that not a lot of bands could pull off, but the best of them, like Van de Graaff Generator, could do it. <laughs> If you listen to Lighthouse Keepers, it's very good, but there are parts which are, which are quite disjointed within it. And that, I think that's fairly obvious that's going to happen. I mean, Peter Hamill wrote this as separate songs or separate parts, and then the band pulled it together. One of the elements that the band brought to it was that at various times you would have half the band playing one section of the piece, while another, the other half of the band played another section of the piece. Now, strange as it may seem, it did actually work at times, although you had to be concentrating pretty carefully to get it. It's quite breathtaking and quite brilliant in its design, in its complexity and in its execution. And I think it's the highlight of Van de Graaff Generator's career. <laughs> Van de Graaff split up after Porn Hearts and Peter Hammer went solo for a couple of years. And then he felt it was time to reorganise Van de Graaff, as it were. I think to reunite or reform is probably not the right term for someone like Hamill. There was a new energy, you know, like they'd, they'd found it was time that they wanted to be with each other again. And I think God Bluff was one of those moments. They'd come back, there was a lot of energy, a lot of the, the ingredients were still there, the, the unusual time signatures. You know, the musicians basically weren't going to change that much in, in the few years that they hadn't been working together as, a, as Van de Graaff Generator. Um, but they were bringing fresh ideas in as well, and I think that is reflected in the whole of the record, and it's, it's a very focused record.
To me, it sounds like it's just seamless development and progress from the previous album. I think this is them at the, at the top of their game. We didn't work with a producer anymore, so we were grown-ups now. We didn't need to be told how to record or how to mix or how to, you know, even how to start laying down tracks, all of the things that we had to be taught. We knew all of that, so I you know it was, a, it was a very exciting time. But we went in there and we just banged things down. You know, we, we did more than an album in a couple of weeks, you know. Um, we did Paul, uh, God Bluff and, and some of Still Life, you know. We did another couple of extra tracks, so we even had choice. And for the first time in our life, we were ahead in terms of our contractual obligations. We had repertoire. I think the feeling was we were working faster and we were thinking more about li playing live now. More of a live feel to our recordings, I think, then. Scorched Earth certainly lives up to its title. It's a remorseless, vortex of sounds and textures that builds with a kind of anarchy running underneath it, certainly vocally. It's almost shades of Mark E. Smith and the Fall, curiously enough. And then it gets to a sort of magisterial interlude before it builds up once again to an awesome finale. The end of that, of course, is, it's, it's in my humble opinion, it's, uh, it's the master of Hugh Banton because it's probably one of those things where he said, look, you know, you've got all this stuff to resolve. Da -da 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 -da. I, there's all these different ideas and things. I can't remember what they all are because there's about 10 more ingredients that go into it. Resolve them all, fuse them all back into each other, change key a hundred times in some stressful hypnotic resolution and you know you've got a blinding end and put and find a rhythm an underlying drum thunder that can go through this four minutes of devastating conclusion and uh, and you've got van der Graaff writing at its peak really and it's an incredible piece to play The Scorched Earth, I think, is, is I suppose you could describe it as Van de Graaff Generator at full throttle, really. It's where all their complex arrangements really come together. I think if, if you, you know, if you, if you, if you played Scorched Earth in isolation to somebody who had never heard Van de Graaff before, that, that would probably sum up the band pretty well. I mean, it's got all the elements there uh, up and running. It's got the compound time signatures. It's got the brain scrambling bits of musicianship, it's got the big tune, it's got the monster riff. Van de Graaff generator, business as usual. It's got basically a triplet feel to it. But it's got bars of 4-4, four, 5-4 four, four, and 7-4. So not unusual for a Van de Graaff generator. And it starts with a sort of very anthemic sort of um, theme at the beginning and then moves off into all these different sort of layers of sound. You've got 20th century classical music, you've got contemporary jazz, you've got psychedelia. You've got, most importantly I think, you haven't got any showy displays of um, instrumental expertise which uh, characterised a lot of the progressive rock bands of that period. 
um, you know, somebody would suddenly go off on a you know three-hour keyboard solo. There's none of that. It's just very, very compact, very well thought out, and, and um, very mature sounding. Sleepwalkers ends the God Buff album in style. It has the same um, awesome build-up going on with it, but there appear to be a few more jaunty moments. They, they are able to relax for a moment and let a few more musical interludes, lighter musical interludes, intrude. The first half is very restrained, very delicate with uh, Banton, and um, Jackson kind of dancing a little minuet round each other. It is just on and on, streams of consciousness, and you don't, the rhythms are complex and changing, the, um, the structure is weird, but it's not weird if you understand Peter and you understand the lyrics. It's kind of building blocks, it's building blocks of, of themes and developments and key changes. What wonderful arpeggios, uh, you know, because then they're, they're not expected intervals, and they're very, they're lovely fourths and fifth intervals all the way, big, big steps in music that you know that open everything up. Great big steps, that create this open landscape to which you can put the tune right down the middle. And then you get this extraordinary thing. You get a Van de Graaff generator joke. You get a, a bit of cheesy come dancing uh, music, which is very, very funny. And it's also very expertly done. Not what you expect to hear. It's fun. I mean, it's just fun. It's f humorous, but for some reason, it, it makes a very poignant statement in the the story. It's a story, really. Not that I ever really understood it. But. And then the second half of the song is the same uh, tunes, the, the verse and the chorus and the middle eight, but it's done in um, a more regular, hard rocking uh, style. I think it's a brilliant piece of work. The main thing about the God Bluff album, and in particular this track, is there's quite a strong musical theme running through the record. And also his lyrics have got a little lighter at this point. Uh, everything was a little bit more melodic than it had been in the past. There's four tracks on the album. I don't think Sleepwalkers is particularly one that stands out above the others. I think they've all got their merit on that album. I think for Van de Graaff fans, God Bluff was probably the ultimate comeback album for them. I don't think they could have done any better. Um, they certainly, I think, pleased their hardcore following by, you know, being typically indulgent and, 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 um, and intense or whatever. But um, there was a degree of accessibility there also that I think had been missing previously. They came back a more disciplined band. They came back with more of a vision of how to work in a studio, how to be a proper band. And because of that, I think, although God Bluff is much slicker, much smoother and much more cohesive as a piece of work, it doesn't have what those earlier albums had. So personally for me, it was an extremely disappointing comeback, although it's raved about by almost the rest of the world because it has so much good music on it. But to me, no, sorry, I don't think they should have reformed. God Bluff for me is a bit too heavy and kind of discordant and not really, um, you know, not my favourite album at all, frankly, not my cup of tea really. It's only got four pieces of music on it, and all four pieces are very, very good. But I still would say that not one of them is better than the classic material from the first phase of their career. It's a worthy comeback. 
it's not a pointless comeback, but it's certainly not you know the be all and end all of Van der Graaff Generator's career. Van de Graaff Generator, you can't actually quantify in terms of rated, overrated, underrated. They're all three. They're rated by those who know and understand them. They're underrated by those who've never heard them because they haven't heard them. And everyone should hear Van de Graaff Generator. And they're overrated by those who put this mark of genius on them. They weren't geniuses. Had they been briefly successful, they would have gone back to obscurity again. As it was, they remained a powerful cult influence on other people. They were always going to be more influential to other bands, probably than they were ever going to be to the public. This was a band whose unique impact was the fact that no one realised what they were doing, least of all themselves. And here we are in the 21st century talking about a band whose, for me, their great works are now 30 years plus away, but it doesn't sound like it belongs there. Now, I think the time is ripe for reappraisal of, of Van de Graaff Generator um, because, you know, without a doubt, they deserve it. Yeah.